pray that you might not just enable us to give, but Lord, remember, remind us what we're giving toward. God, that's where we receive the blessing. And I just ask that you would uh, help us now in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 Cut 
That's him, right? Amen. Thank the Lord for his goodness to us. Let's open up our Bible to Luke chapter 11. We'll take a thought from that chapter today. Luke chapter 11 this morning. Get that if you would. And here on Sunday evenings for a good while, we've been going through the Gospel of Matthew. If you're unable to be with us at that time, we're all the way to chapter 22. I'm not saying that's where we'll be tonight. Uh, see my... A couple of days ago, the Lord might have been directing me in another way, but uh, we'll just wait and see. I'm not going to speak too soon. But uh, uh, we've been going through there and talking about uh, the king because Matthew emphasizes Jesus as king. Uh, and then right, right from it is the Gospel of Mark where the emphasis is of Jesus as the prophesied servant. Now, that's not to say that you won't find references to Christ being king in the other Gospels, or him being the prophesied servant of Jehovah uh, in the other Gospels, but it's emphasized in those Gospels. And uh, so you have him on one extreme here, he's the king, and the other uh, spectrum, he is he is the servant of the Lord. Well, John's Gospel and Luke's Gospel do the same, whereas John's Gospel emphasizes Christ as the Son of God, therefore God the Son, speaking of his deity. Luke's Gospel emphasizes him as the Son of Man, magnifying uh, His sinless humanity. As Christ, of course, is both 100% the Lord and 100% man, such is the mystery of godliness. That's what we believe. And, and as a man, Christ was humble, uh, holy. He was devout. Uh, Christ was a man of prayer. He was one that uh, was dependent upon Scripture. And in that respect, He is the supreme example. Here in Luke chapter 11, verse 1, Luke chapter 11, verse 1 says, And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, 
teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. And just to notice here, one of his disciples is watching him pray, beholding that, that example. And uh, it begins to fan a passion of his that creates a desire. And so he says to him, Lord, teach us to pray. And uh, that's what I want to preach on today. I want to preach on learning the importance of prayer. Learning the importance of prayer. Not just learning about prayer, but we have to with conviction now, learn the importance of it. Because if we fail to pray, we're just plain failing. And uh, what we do together as a local church, as much as what we heard this morning uh, in, in Brother Andy's lesson, is too important to fail. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father, Lord, we call upon you. I ask, Lord, that you'll help me. Lord, I pray you'll help me as I preach this message on prayer. Lord, that you'll help me in the pulpit, and then you'll go beyond the pulpit, Lord God, and bear witness to the truth uh, in the hearts of the hearers, Lord God, that have gathered here. And uh, bless, Lord God, by your grace, according to the riches of your mercy. Uh, Lord, help us as a church to lay hold upon this simple truth. And... uh, Lord, not just to be hearers, but to be doers. God, I pray you'll help us to take serious assessment of where we're at in regards to our devotion towards praying. And uh, Lord, these that are faithful to pray, I pray, God, that they'll be encouraged. And if there's someone, Lord, God needs to become faithful to pray, I pray, Lord, the message would do exactly as as you would have it to do today. Give reproof and exhortation, strengthen their hands towards this labor of prayer. Lord God, we thank you for being gracious to us. For the song of Brother Ben and his family saying, uh, for your son Jesus Christ, Lord, we thank you for the blood. We ask for consecration now and ask you to participate in the meeting. In Jesus' name, amen. A moment a person is born again, according to Scripture, they're born into the family of God and are said to become members of Christ's body. And of course, that's speaking of, a, of the spiritual organism of Christ's body, a living spiritual body of people that the Bible says is made up of both Jew and Gentile, all from the time that he would first give his spirit, all the way to the calling out of all those who have the spirit of God. Uh, They make up this this body as we're joined together by the same spirit, and we're called the church. Now, when you think of church, you think, well, I'm going to church today, and you came to church today. This here is Trinity Baptist Church, It's a local church. That's our fellowship. And as such, this here is an organization. And whereas the body of Christ, speaking of the church as a whole, is not merely local, it's not regional, it's not national, uh, it's not even past or present or future. It's all those things at the same time. Uh, The church is in the sense of the body of Christ, uh, of which we were spiritually born into, the moment we were spiritually baptized into the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, it's made up of all saved people uh, during this 2,000-year stretch here uh, all the way to the present unto the end of the age. And all nationalities, all races, all social backgrounds, economic backgrounds, uh, that's throughout the world. And as such, that's not an organization. That's an organism. Uh, That is a spiritual living body of people. And in regards to the ministry now, in regards to the actual work of the ministry, such is ordained. It is is organized through uh, these types of organizations uh, empowered by the same Spirit that has joined us together, uh, and believers throughout the world who have come together, joined together, committed to each other and to the Lord uh, to carry out His work. In other words, God has committed the work of the ministry to local churches uh, throughout the organism of the body of Christ, wherever that may be uh, throughout the world. Therefore, when we're speaking of the body itself, the church as a whole, it has one head, which of course is Christ alone, and we're blessed to be uh, bone of His bone and flesh of His flesh, joined to Him by His blood through the Holy Spirit. But as we consider the work of the ministry, such as the local church ministries throughout the world, uh, whether it be pastors and teachers that are working within uh, the local church, or whether it be evangelists or what we would call missionaries working out from those ministries, we're to serve together. Uh, The Bible says we're to exhort one another, we're to comfort one another, we're to love one another, all towards the end 
of the purpose of the work of getting the seed of the word out and, of course, of furthering the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, to all nations and to every creature. Uh, therefore, all the commands there uh, that were given in the New Testament uh, regarding our relationship with one another are, are, are commands that involve us esteeming one another, thinking upon one another, forgiving one another. See, all that is in order to preserve a working relationship because the work is great. You understand? The work of Trinity Baptist Church is a great work. It's important that it gets done. And it's important that every organization of believers from this great spiritual body takes their role in God's work seriously. Now, that being said, uh, we know ourselves. Amen? I mean, you know you, I know me. You know me, I know you. And, uh, and the fact, some of you folks, you know, I, I went to school with you. We come up together. The Bible says a prophet is not without honor. Save his own country. And, and, uh, and some of you remember how I was in school, a blockhead and all that. You didn't hold it against me. You still came in and by the will of God we joined together and, and we're, we're committed towards the work with one another. But my point is, knowing ourselves, we can easily figure out that we can't do the work of God. <laughs> Can't be done like that, amen? We're not going to organize until we get it done because we organized it. Uh, it just, it's not going to rely on us. We can't do it, and the Lord knows this. And so the provision that the Lord has given in order for us to get it done is His own Spirit. Uh, the Spirit of God has empowered us to be witnesses unto Jesus Christ, and it's through that Spirit that, that we can have true fellowship with Him and that we can join in with Him in His work that, uh, that it may get done. Now, therefore, the spiritual labor, the spiritual labor of a ministry like the one you're in today, uh, this is the greatest, uh, most important thing that's going on uh, for a work like Trinity Baptist Church when we talk about the spiritual labor. And of course, we're referring to prayer. And of course, we need more of it. And, and I'm asking you, please consider your prayer lives today as to whether or not you're serious about it, and consider, if you would, the work of God as to whether or not we're serious about such as a local church. You see, the Word of God must go out, and the gospel of Jesus Christ must be broadcasted, and I mean broadcasted not just as, as Brother Mike and Aaron and, and Brandon and these folks dealing with things like, uh, you know, uh, Facebook and YouTube, and, I mean, they're working, they're putting it out, thank God for them. But broadcasting, it, 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 the origin of the word is to reach in that bag of seed and cast it abroad. I mean, to put it out, amen. Broadcast the word of God. Put out the gospel of Jesus Christ. Whatever you can do to get it out, get it out. Uh, put it out. Now, if people hear it, uh, they might believe it. And if they believe it, that's the power of God and the salvation. And that means it will more than change their life. Amen. It's good when a life gets changed, but, but more than that, it'll change where they'll spend eternity. And, and where a person will spend eternity, the importance of that cannot be overstated. The Lord's not willing that any should perish. You understand? The Lord's not willing that any should perish. And many, many are perishing. And Christ paid the sin debt for every man, for every woman. Uh, for every child, boy and girl, and God raised him from the dead as declaration that the debt is paid. Amen. Like the song says, the cross, it standeth still. Uh, the blood has been shed once and for all. The tomb's still empty. Uh, Christ is yet alive. Justice has been carried out. But sinners must believe. They must believe. And to believe, they must hear. And for them to hear, we got to get it out there we got to broadcast it. In order for us to get it out, we have to remain together. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, uh, he talks about the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, that's not the ecumenical spirit of unity. Again, that's a false spirit. The unity of the Spirit is the Spirit of God that brings us together and keeps us in working order so that we may broadcast the gospel and sow the seed of the Word of God. And, and that's what God's calling for. And even if we can do that, and stay on the same page, and get the gospel out, and do all that He's commanded us to do, He'll still say, it's not by might, not by power, but by my Spirit, saith God. Because that's exactly what it'll take to get it done. Being committed to the work of God means being committed to joining in 
with God as he does his work. Now let me say that again. Being committed to the work of God means that we are joining in with God as He does His work. It pleases Him to involve us in His work. And only He can do this work. And, and so we need Him, you understand. Uh, there's always much more going on in the work of God than what you see. Amen. I mean, there's more going on. There's a spiritual enemy, an adversary you can't see. Uh, there are unclean spiritual forces abounding, working behind the scenes. And I'm just saying as clear as I can, and yet it's urgent as I know how, there must be prayer. There has to be some praying going on. And, uh, and the fact is we've got to realize that, that part of our opponent's objective, part of our adversary's plan, his strategy, if you will, is to keep us off our knees. It's to keep us uh, from uh, our prayer closets and from joining together and praying together and trusting God together. That's part of his job. That's part of what he wants to accomplish. And so seeking to work with God. That's what I'm talking about. When I talk about our, our, the importance of prayer today, seeking to work with God, not just work for God, but to work with Him. That's a huge part of what prayer is. And therefore a local church can't afford to ignore it. And that means that the members of a local church can't afford to ignore it. You can't have a spiritual church without spiritual members. Amen. Amen. That's just the way it works. Our church just isn't as spiritual. We'll try becoming a little more spiritual. Amen. Amen. It's really easy just to paint it all with one big brush and act like you're a part from it. But if you're part of it, you're part of the solution if there's a problem. And if you're going to have a spiritual church, you've got to have spiritual members. And, and I say all that to say this. If you're going to have a praying church, you better have praying members. Otherwise, you won't have it. The local church, according to 1 Timothy 3.15, is called the house of God, the pillar of the truth, the ground of the truth, and the church of the living God, meaning a called out assembly of the living God. And all that right there is a message in itself, which I'm not going to touch today, except to, to define it as he talks about the church in 1 Timothy chapter 3. The context there is of a local ministry. And he deals with bishops and deacons there. He's not talking about the church as a whole. Again, there is one head. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ of the church as a whole. But when he talks about bishops and leadership there with the deacons, uh, there in 1 Timothy chapter 3, he goes on to talk about the church. And, and he's talking about a local church. He talks about, again, the house of God, the pillar of the truth, the ground of the truth, the church of the living God. And that's the context. And so uh, Jesus defines what is the truth. According to John 17, 17, you see it every time you pull in the church. Sanctify them through thy truth. On the way out, thy word is truth. Uh, God has defined the truth as his word. Jesus said it is the word of God. And so a local church is to be the pillar of the truth. You understand this? We're talking about what is our function? What does God expect? He expects us to be a pillar of the truth. That is to support the word of God. To hold up the word of God. And then he expects us to be the ground of the truth. The ground of the truth speaks of a place for planting and growth and keeping and nurturing and, and caring for the, for the production. Uh, that's what uh, the church is to be. The church of the living God, again, that speaks to an assembly. Uh, that speaks to our being able to come together, everybody, where they belong, in working order, our assembly, our function. That's the church of the living God. And then as the house of God, we know this, According to the Bible, every believer is a temple of the Holy Ghost. And yet, it's also true that when we come together in the name of Jesus Christ, that there's a special way that God inhabits the praises of His people, and He comes and He participates in our meetings, amen, and uh, bears witness to the truth. We talk about the house of God. We're not talking about this log building. This is a facility. This provides convenience. The house of God is the people of God that are inhabited by the Spirit of God. And as we come together, there's a special way that God meets with us and, and participates in the meeting if we won't get in the way. And that being said, Jesus said of the house of God, He said, my house shall be a house of prayer. And ever since I was preaching along these lines, last Sunday night, I got to thinking about that thought. My house, He said, shall be a house of prayer. And as we've seen there last Sunday night, there are two occasions where the Lord showed that He's very jealous about that matter. 
that the house of God be what it's supposed to be. And he said, my house shall be a house of prayer. Meaning simply this, that as a local organization that bears the name of Jesus Christ and is responsible for the work of God going out, then he expects us to pray. To live lives in dependent prayer, looking to God, communicating with God, trusting God, and prayer is a major function of the New Testament church. Or at least it should be. When a church is not what it's supposed to be, when a church is not what it's supposed to be, it will inevitably become something it's not supposed to be. And that happens. What happened in Christ's day was what was supposed to be His house, His Father's house. He said they had made it a den of thieves. It became something it wasn't supposed to be because it wasn't what it was supposed to be. Instead of working with God and working for God, here's what they did. They made a business out of God's work. And that provoked the jealousy of Christ for His Father's house. And folks, I believe we're witnessing that all over the country. I believe this is what's happening to churches. Well, one of the big Trojan horses uh, of, of apostasy, and there are several, uh, I mentioned in Bible Institute this morning, contemporary music uh, is a Trojan horse for apostasy. People enjoy music and they're willing to put up with any kind of preaching and teaching because uh, the musicians and the worship team, you know. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about. That's good. Some of you that do and you like that stuff, you're going down the wrong road. That stuff's not of God and it leads the wrong place spiritually. And it's a Trojan horse. You've got to be careful. But, but then, that being said, another Trojan horse is just being pragmatic. I mean to turn it into a business where the effect of our corporation is seen by uh, how many people we're reaching and how uh, many folks are getting involved in the growth and all that production just like it was a business. And the pastor now becomes a CEO. He's a chief executive. Uh, I've been in pastor schools. Amen. <laughs> Believe it or not. <laughs> They tried to learn me a thing or two. <laughs> and it went right over my head because there's some of that stuff I just am not going to jive with. I have spent a lifetime of my Christian adulthood trying to beat myself up over things that God did not give me the gifts for. And I see these folks there where, you know, the CEO mentality and they're always thinking and carrying out things and the plans evolving. And, and I think to myself, I just don't think like that. And I see them broadcasting their, their theme for the week and then their theme for the month and then their theme for the year and uh, all the stuff they do to rally. And I'm not saying all oh, that's wrong. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm just saying I don't think like that. And I look at that and I say, well, Lord, help me. And I, God, I want to be a good pastor. I want to be a fruitful pastor. Lord, help me. And, and then the Lord reminds me, you know, none of that stuff you're wanting's in here. <laughs> You understand? Uh, and, and there's some things legitimately, I'm not, don't, don't get me wrong, I need to beat myself up for. <laughs> but there's a lot of stuff that I beat myself up for that, that the Lord don't care about. You understand? And a lot of this stuff where it just becomes a business and, you know, and it's pragmatic. You're, you're not concerned with what's right, you're concerned with what works. And that's a Trojan horse for apostasy. Whatever brings them in. Whatever causes them to enjoy the service, you see. And that's a Trojan horse for apostasy. And we're witnessing it all over the country. We're, we're, seeing, uh, we're seeing churches becoming uh, centers of entertainment and enjoyment. That's all they offer. Now, there's a false evangelism there where the sin of man and his urgent need to be born again are not emphasized or even addressed in some instances uh, where there's no preaching on hell. There's no reproving for sin and wickedness. There's no preaching on righteousness and God's holiness whereupon the Spirit of God convinces men of sin and righteousness and judgment to come. Instead, preaching is presented as sort of a bearing of your life. That is not what preaching is designed to be. It's not the spin. It's supposed to reprove. It's supposed to rebuke. It's supposed to exhort you. You understand? People say, well, I go to church because I want to feel good about myself. Well, they won't last around here. <laughs> at, least, at least I don't think they will. But because you, you need you need grinded. You need sandpapered. Amen. You need worked on. And when you come under the light of the Word of God, you're going to find some blemishes. You're going to find some things where you're not doing it right. You're going to see some areas in your life where you can do better. 
You're going to see some areas where there, there ought to be some changes. Amen. That's any Bible-believing church. That's what's going to happen. And, and what happens is it's just, hey, add a little bit of Jesus. And, and, and you know, treat, it, treat your faith like some sort of, uh, as Brother Andy was talking about superstition, there's some lucky rabbit's foot or something like that, you know, where, uh, you know, hey, it just add a little Jesus and do things your way. And that's a false evangelism. There's also a false edification that we're seeing. Where instead of building up folks on the most holy faith, people are being puffed up. They're being puffed up in their pride and pumped up in these emotional uh, pep rallies. There, it, it, It's all beginning to be labeled as worship. Like I said, here's the party scene. And it looks like some straight out of the world. Amen. If you, if you was on one of those uh, uh, shows there and you're watching all that stuff, if you just turn the sound down... And you see the lights and the fog machine, everybody jumping around, running at each other. Mosh pits, I mean the whole nine yards. Ridiculous nonsense. You never associate any of that you were seeing with Jesus Christ in the Bible. And yet you turn it on, and there's somebody talking about the Lord. And it's strange. It's strange. You know what it is? It's false. On top of all that, there's, there's little true enlightenment. Basically, it's a self-improvement seminar, as I said, being promoted every Sunday, you know, with a, with a thought being live your best life now. And no thought being towards crucifying yourself, denying yourself, setting your affections on things above, not on things on the earth, but mortifying uh, the members that are on the earth. It's just the opposite of that message. It's about having it now. Health and wealth, the gospel of prosperity. Enjoying it now. No edification. No evangelism. No enlightenment. Local churches all over our nation becoming something they're not supposed to be. You understand? Because they weren't what they were supposed to be to begin with. Amen? They weren't a house of prayer. They never learned the importance of joining themselves with God while He did His work. And watch Him work. In order to reach more and enlarge their influence, they went these false ways because, again, they're pragmatic. They want to do what works. And so the power of God's absent because God's not involved in the work because the failure to join in with the Lord in His work. And there's been no emphasis placed upon true, effectual, fervent, righteous praying. Now, understand this morning, I'm not scolding anybody here today. I, I, in fact, I know there are folks here that your prayer life is very serious to you. I know there are folks here that pray and you're serious about it, and that's a blessing to know. Uh, myself, uh, I've been here 21, maybe 22 years, I don't know, and uh, a third of our Wednesday night services were dedicated to this very subject. Very subject of prayer there, where for seven years I began to preach on the subject of prayer, and what I found out during that seven-year period was that it's an inexhaustible subject. Now, there came a time when having learned what I needed to learn as far as preaching on the subject, that's what God was showing me as a preacher, that I could just, <laughs> this could go on forever, that the Lord allowed me to move on, and since then I preached on other things. But, but the objective, you understand, was never to just preach on as long as I could or, while trying to keep it fresh, or even to preach on as long as I did. The objective was that we might be a praying church, that God's house might be a house of prayer. And as it comes to the subject of prayer, there are different people I've studied after and read after. And, uh, and one man in particular is a man named Ian Bounds. Now, Ian Bounds, uh, I, I speak of him oftentimes. If you were to read his works, you'd find some areas where doctrinally he, he's got some problems. That's kind, of a, that's kind of a problem. There are areas there where God speaks to him and, or uses him rather uh, to give us some good truths about prayer. And we can learn a lot from him when it comes to prayer. Uh, but then you're going to get into some areas there where you're going to realize, well, wait a second now, I'm not sure I agree with that. And you know what the flesh does? The flesh says, ah, they <laughs> write the source off. Well, that's not wise. If you can learn something from him when it comes to prayer, you do good to learn something from him. Regardless of what areas you may disagree with him on, and, and here's something, a quote I've used here time and time again because I think it's always time. But here's what he says. He says, We are constantly on a stretch, if not a strain, to devise new methods, new plans, new organizations to advance the church and secure enlargement and efficiency for the gospel. This trend of the day has a tendency to lose sight of the man or sink the man in the plan or organization. God's plan is to make much of the man 
far more of Him than anything else. Men are God's method. The church is looking for better methods. God is looking for better men. Amen, amen. Then he goes on to write this. He says, what the church needs today is not more machinery or better, not new organizations or more novel methods, but men whom the Holy Ghost can use. Men of prayer, men mighty in prayer. The Holy Ghost does not flow through methods, but through men. He does not come on machinery, but on men. He does not anoint plans, but men. Men of prayer. Folks, all that is on the money. All that is on the money. God is looking for better men. That's what He wrote. I believe that to be the case. If we're going to be better men, if we're going to be better women, the women, <laughs> men be men, women be women. <laughs> what a day. Amen. you got to clarify everything. <laughs> but if we're going to be better at it, we're going to have to be better Christians. That's where it starts. And if we're going to be better Christians, prayer is going to play a whole big part in that ever happening. You see, uh, prayer, I'll remind you, uh, with the Word of God, is a means of keeping the heart. It's a means of keeping the heart. I just came this morning just uh, to, to give you something, like Peter said, just to stir you up by putting you in remembrance of some things. You've got to understand the importance of prayer. You've got to understand the importance of praying. Nothing will help you more than prayer whenever there's something wrong with your spirit. Whenever there's something wrong with your spirit or you're troubled in your heart, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And, and we're told that whenever there's a problem backsliding, that it started in the heart. The Bible says the backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. Notice, the backslider in heart. Backsliding begins in the heart, and prayer, I'm telling you, is a means of keeping the heart. And by keeping the heart, it's like keeping a garden. You know, you, you've kept a garden, and, and there's some things when you're gardening, there's some things got to be yanked out, right? I mean, otherwise it'll choke out what you're trying to grow, something that's good, and something come along and choke that out, and then you got something you don't want there. And uh, again, when it comes to the heart, uh, there's some things in there you don't want growing. It'll come out, and it'll defy the whole life, Jesus said. In Mark chapter 7, verse 21, Jesus said, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and defile the man. That's what Jesus said. You know what he said? He said, you got all kinds of nasty, wicked, sinful things in your heart. And you know what godly character is? Godly character is the growth of the new man to the point you're able to suppress that inner wickedness. Now some of you don't believe you've got that in your heart. But it's there. The Lord knows. And you've got to be able to keep it out of your life. You've got to be able to keep it down. Now, the nature of man, once a person is saved, these things will creep into that heart and they have to be yanked out just like weeds in a garden. And then in a garden, some things got to be run off, kept out. That happens there. Uh, things will enter into the heart. It will bring about a response that will lead to the corruption of our lives and, and show the weakening of a life where things come in and spoil and rob from the heart all qualities that are to be pleasing unto the Lord. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 9. Get Matthew chapter 9. And God has called us, therefore, to pray. He's called us to pray. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Luke 18, 1, Luke said of Jesus, He spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Luke 21, 36, Jesus speaking, He says, Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. I understand in Luke 21, 36 there that he's speaking of the context of the tribulation, something different than the context uh, we're living in today, but still there is the need to stand today. And there being the need to stand, Jesus says, watch you therefore and pray always that you may be able to stand. Because there's the need to stand, folks, there's a need to pray. Romans 12, 12 says rejoice in hope, Pati patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Ephesians 6.18 says, Praying always with all prayer 
and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Colossians 4.2, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. 1 Peter 4.7, but the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. God expects us to pray. It's His house. We, we didn't come together because we liked each other. I like you. Don't get me wrong. Oh, if you like me. Amen. But that's not our objective. That's not even the basis of our fellowship. That's not even the foundation of our fellowship. Amen. We don't come together because we're related to each other and make the same kind of money every year. We vote for the same people. That's not the foundation of this fellowship here. Our foundation has to do with the Word of God and the name of Jesus Christ and the gospel going out and the importance of all that plays in our role of pleasing God. That's what's important. And when we are not interested in those things, what are we here for? Amen. This isn't just a hangout. You understand? It's not a social club. It's not a family reunion. It's about the work of God. It's about broadcasting the glory of God as it's revealed in the face, in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, prayer changes things, obviously. God has seen fit in His wisdom and power to answer our prayers. As that happens there, we see that good is accomplished about the things that we're praying about. Uh, the act of prayer then, again, is... It gets things done. Obviously, God answers prayer, but it's also a means of joining with God in fellowship as He seeks to do His work, and He's called us to pray about such. And, and with that being said, we could find over 30 different instances in the life of Jesus when He was on earth where He prayed. Prayer meetings of the Lord Jesus Christ testified in Scripture. Now here in the Gospel of Matthew, in connection to the work at hand, look at Matthew 9, 36, a passage most of you are familiar with. But it says there, Matthew 9, 36, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he'll send forth laborers into his harvest. And what strikes me there, and always has, is that is a prayer request. That is a prayer request. I mean, we've all collected prayer requests and uh, different settings there. People come and told you, hey, I'd like for you to pray about something. Imagine being in a group of people. Anybody got a prayer request and the hand of the Lord Jesus comes up? He says, I have something I want you all to pray about. I want you to pray about all this work that needs to be done. I don't want you to pray about needing some people to come help you do it. I want you to pray about that. The Lord made a prayer request. He said, I need you to pray about something. That's amazing. He said, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest. And think about that. He's the Lord of the harvest. <laughs> Amen. You know what he's showing you? He's showing there's an order to this. Right? John Wesley says, God does nothing but an answer to prayer. <laughs> and you know what God will do? God will sometimes, He will provoke people to pray because there's something He wants to involve them in. I think of Abraham there where he's going to pray about Sodom, but the, but the motive in Abraham's prayer was what? It was the deliverance of Lot, right? <laughs> and uh, he prays for Sodom. <laughs> And next thing he knows there, I mean, he's, he's like they say, Jewed him down to ten because there's ten people that are in Lot's family. And if Lot just had the influence with his family, he should have had the whole city would have been saved. And, and yet it's down to ten and he doesn't have the influence he needs to have with his family. He makes it out of there with two daughters. That's it. The rest of them are gone. Lot leaves and he has his two daughters because even with his others, other children there and their son-in-law, his son-in-laws, uh, it seemed, as he warned them, he seemed as one that mocked. He had no testimony anymore. He's trying to be serious, and they weren't taking him serious. And what ends up happening is the Lord comes and gets him out of there, and he is delivered, but not Sodom, not Gomorrah. It goes down. Because there wasn't ten righteous there. And as the Lord's getting ready to pull off that judgment, he stops at Abraham there and says, Shall I hide this thing from Abraham? Shall I hide from Abraham that thing I do? 
And he goes on to list the reasons why he won't. And what he does is he provokes Abraham's prayers. And Abraham prays. Now, as I, I've been told years ago, God will often deny the, the form of our petition that he may answer the substance of our request. And what that simply means is that there's a lot of things that we may be praying about that God will not answer. But he understands why we're praying about it. And in his wisdom, he knows how to answer that prayer. And in that situation there, Lot is praying, or rather, Abraham is praying for Lot. But he's mentioned in Sodom. And next thing you're told is Abraham's standing off there in the horizon of Sodom, and the smoke's coming up. And as far as he knows, that's it. Meanwhile, God behind the scenes is getting Lot out of there. God's getting him out of there. You know, he says later on in the New Testament, he says, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. And he mentions Lot as an example. You know how he got Lot out of there? He provokes a man to pray for Lot. You say, well, why would he do that? I don't know. Why would the Lord of the harvest say, hey, pray to the Lord of the harvest? Amen. Could it be he wants you to be a part of what he wants done? That's what fellowship with God is. Fellowship isn't just having a cup of coffee and eating a piece of apple pie. Fellowship is you're on one side of the yoke and he's in the other side of the yoke. And you're going the same direction. That's fellowship. And the Lord has called us to fellowship with him. That's what prayer is. It's joining with God as he seeks to do his work. And prayer changes things, specific things, amen. Doctrinally, uh, you know, they're, they're, to be more correct about that, God changes things as we pray to Him about those things. Uh, God will, will answer that prayer according to His wisdom. But keep in mind, there are different things that, that can work together to form a prayer. Be a part of a prayer, or uh, together they can form a part of a prayer, or, or be a prayer in themselves. And one is the matter of praise. Uh, praise causes us to magnify the Lord in our hearts. Uh, that means that praise serves us well in regards to our faith. To magnify the Lord. I, I don't know how much time you do uh, spend in that when you're praying, but it serves you well to praise the Lord. To praise God. That means uh, it pleases the Lord, it edifies the believer. Uh, we, we look at the difficulties of working with people, we look at the challenges, we look at the obstacles. And it can all seem overwhelming, bigger than us. <clears throat> and, it, and it is. But as we begin to praise the Lord, it encourages the heart. Uh, we can think about things to the point we're discouraged. We can get discouraged to the point we're almost crippled in it, spiritually speaking. We're just stuck. It's so big. It's so overwhelming. Don't know what to do. But then you get down and you start talking to God. And you start telling Him. God, you're the rock. You never change. You're omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. You start raising up the name of God, magnifying Him. You can't make God any bigger than He is, but you can magnify Him in your heart to where your problems and your fears and the challenges aren't overwhelming anymore because God is bigger. God is greater. That's how praise strengthens faith in the heart. That's how you, it's a means of keeping the heart. And then also there's the matter of thanksgiving, a part of praying. Now finding that prayer closet every day, giving thanks. Uh, that's part of being filled with the Holy Spirit, according to Ephesians chapter 5, is remaining a, with a thankful attitude. And there's a slight difference of praising God and giving thanks. You're thanking God for what He's done. You're praising God for who He is. And remembering to give thanks, that protects the heart. It protects against the sin of bitterness. Because by nature, men look at what they've got and then they look at what you've got. Amen. That's the nature of men. You look at what you've got and then you look at what your neighbor has. And inevitably, you're going to find some neighbor out there that's got more than you. And you better be thankful for what God's given you because first of all, you didn't deserve what He gave you. And, uh, and you need to fight against that bitterness, that sin of bitterness and pray about the things God has given you. Amen. And, and, and be thankful. It serves the heart well. And then the matter of confession of sins. That's certainly a part of prayer. 
Uh, and, and any believer that's struggling in your prayer life and you haven't been faithful in your prayer life, you ought to start with that one. Lord, I want to confess the sin of prayerlessness. That I haven't taken this as serious as I should have. Folks, whatsoever is not a faith is sin. And going in our own strength and self-reliance should be recognized as sin. Especially when we shouldn't. Especially when we ought to realize this is the work of God. God's got to do it. A time of confession of sin, you just get real honest. Before the Lord about the sins of your heart, your pride in your mouth, your lips, your tongue, your throat, your belly, your hands, your feet, your imaginations, your thoughts. Amen. All those things you begin to reckon under the Lord. You know what it does? It keeps pride down. You want to keep pride down because God he is committed to resist the proud. He's against it. Like we say down here, He's against it. He's against pride. He's against the proud. Keep the heart. Confess your sins. There's also the matter of intercession. That's to be a part of praying. Where you're praying for others about their needs. Amen. That stands against selfishness. Someone who just focused with himself. Someone who only sees their own needs. They only focus on their own problems, their own desires, their own wants. You know what helps is when you get in prayer and you lock down on someone else and what they need, what their request is, what their desire is, what their challenge is. You sit down and you begin to pray about that. That strikes a blow against several wicked things invading our heart and corrupting our lives. Then, of course, there's making requests. We all know that part of prayer. <laughs> we just tell God what it is you want, what you desire, what you need. But it speaks again to a certain degree to keep in the heart. Because rather than trying to work for it and jimmy it, or we would say Jacob it, you're just trusting the Lord. You're asking God uh, to meet your request. And, and that is a form of keeping the heart. Now, if what I just said is true, and I have no doubt that what I just told you is absolutely correct, if you neglect your prayer life, you're going to become irritable and overwhelmed. Because of a lack of praising God. You're going to be ungrateful and discontent through a lack of giving thanks. You're going to become burdened and proud because no confession of sins ever being properly made. You're going to become selfish and self-absorbed because you're not spending time praying for others. And you're going to be self-reliant trying to jake up your way through areas and situations in life because you're not trusting God with simple requests. And the long and short of it is if you don't see the importance of praying and you're not faithful to pray, you're not walking with God. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. And you're putting confidence in yourself to work things out rather than trusting God and requesting it at His hand. You may have heard the appeal, the prayer that was made by, of all people, Benjamin Franklin uh, at the Continental Convention there. Uh, not a professing Christian, been labeled a deist, meaning that he... Uh, he, he might have believed in God, but didn't believe God was interested in the affairs of men. But uh, sometimes I wonder if the labels we have today and, and how we fit them to certain persons today, we try to force them to someone back then. Because it, it's just not that simple with some of those guys. When you go back and you read some of the things they wrote, and you see some of the things they said, and following the Revolutionary War with Great Britain, while men are arguing about the Constitution and the government, several things by that point have at least made an impact on this man there, at least for a little while. Those men have been arguing for five weeks. No progress has been made. A few of them getting up, walking out at times. One of them finally got up and he was ready to leave for good. And uh, as the story goes, George Washington followed him out. He was the president of the Congress there at that time. And he goes to him and he tells him, please wait around uh, that Benjamin Franklin was about to address them. And uh, some of what's recorded uh, is this. Uh, Franklin said, he arose to speak, he said, he said, in this situation of this assembly, groping as it were in the dark to find political truth and scarce able to distinguish it when it's presented to us. How has it happened, sir, that we have not hitherto watched through uh, thought of humbly applying to the Father of lights to illuminate our understanding? In the beginning of the contest with Great Britain, when we were sensible of danger, we had daily prayer in this room for divine protection. Our prayers, sir, were heard, and they were graciously answered. All of us who are engaged in the struggle must have observed frequent instances of a superintending providence in our favor. 
To that kind providence we owe this happy opportunity of consulting in peace on the means of establishing our future uh, nation. And have we now forgot that powerful friend? I have lived, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it possible that an empire can rise without his aid? We, we have assured, sir, in the second writing, that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. I believe this. I also believe that without his concurring aid, we shall uh, succeed in this political building no better than the builders of Babel. We shall be divided by our little partial local interest. Our projects will be confounded. We ourselves shall become a reproach and a byword down to future ages. And what's worse, mankind may hereafter from this unfortunate instance despair of establishing government of uh, be human wisdom and leave it to chance, war, and conquest. Now he had some other things to say there, but, but afterwards those men broke for three days of what they said was prayer and fasting. And when they came together, they had a brand new attitude about getting the matter settled. And thus, we have benefited uh, as a free society based on the Constitution. Amen. God blessing them to put together, a not a perfect document, but a great one. <laughs> and, and, and I wasn't there, obviously. And I can't tell you all for sure what went on, and exactly what was said, but I'll say this, that what was recorded in those notes, what was said by Benjamin Franklin was absolutely spot on. It was right. He was saying this. He was saying, this whole matter of what we're trying to do, what we're trying to do here, he said, this whole thing, it's not going to happen unless God does it. And in order for God to do it, he said, we're going to have to pray. We're going to have to ask Him to. We're going to have to get Him involved through our prayers. See, the less of God that's involved, the more of us that must be, and the more of us that's involved, the greater the vanity. It's for nothing. Because you're you and I'm me. And without the Lord, we are nothing. That's us. That's us. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And again, what we're talking about here today as a local church, an organization that exists for revealing the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ. That's the ministry, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Sowing the seed. Broadcasting the gospel. What we're trying to do is trying to get everybody to join in with the Lord as He does the work that must be done. And today, if you're lacking in your prayer life or you've been lacking for a while, I, I, would, I would urge you, as sincere as I know how, to get that ship corrected. Get your course settled. Get things back on track because this is too important for us to let down. I want to ask you to stand. Let's go to the Lord in praying. And uh, you think about where you're at today in regards to this message, what the Lord has directed us to hear, keep in the heart, keep in the heart, joining in with the Lord in fellowship. praying about things, trusting God, waiting on God. Those areas. God glories in that He is able to hear our prayers and God glories in that He's able to answer our prayers. Father, I pray You'll help us today as we consider where we're at in regard to having a prayer life. And uh, Lord, I pray that You'll help us if there's uh, those here that need to get that corrected. Lord, help them get it corrected today. Lord, help us to realize what a great privilege and honor it is to be able to talk to you and God, how you'll hear, how you'll answer. And then in the process of our communicating with you, our own heart and the, the burdens and desires of our heart, you work on us. And prayer keeps the heart. It maintains the heart. It gives correction in life. God, I thank you, Lord, for the blessings of being able to pray. Help us to be faithful. We pray in Jesus' name. With our heads bowed, our eyes closed, and as Robin, she begins to play.